Whole Foods Salon. I think many of you have been here before. We do these events once a month. This is Erica Sonnenberg. She and her husband have a lab at Stanford. Today she's going to talk all about the microbiota and microbiome. When I was in medical school, all I learned was that the gut bacteria was dangerous. And as Erica will teach us today, there is a whole facet of beneficial bacteria. Her book, The Good Gut, is fabulous. If you don't have it, we're selling it today. Enjoy, Erica. I just want to thank all of you for coming. Thank Jeannie for inviting me. This is um, a very exciting opportunity for me to get to speak to all of you. So I'm, I'm happy to tell you about what we're learning in our lab uh, about the gut microbiota or microbiome. I use both words interchangeably. That just means the bacteria that live in our gut. Um, I'm a senior research scientist in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. My husband and I came to Stanford about nine years ago, started this lab together. We have about 15 people now working in the lab, and we're interested in understanding what these bacteria are doing in, their gut, in our gut and how we can maximize what they're doing for our best health. So this is an image that our lab took. In my opinion, it's the most beautiful image of the microbiota that's ever been taken. It actually came in second place in a Nikon Small Worlds uh, photo contest. We were beaten out by a picture of a, a bee, I think, collecting pollen. Um, so anyway, I, I, it's my opinion that it's the best image, and, um, and apparently Nikon thinks it was pretty cool too. So what this image shows, this is all the bacteria in the gut, this is a, a cross section of the colon. So all these little jelly bean looking things are all bacteria. And these are all the ce human cells. So these, each one of these blue circles is the nuclei of a cell. And then this is a green mucus layer that separates them from us. And what you can see, the, the striking thing, you know, I've, I've been studying this community of bacteria for, for 15 years. And we knew that there's lots of them, but until you see the picture, you don't have in your mind just how plentiful they are, how much they outnumber our own intestinal cells. So they are a huge part of who we are as humans. We have trillions of these microbes, 100 trillion in each of our guts. If you count up all the genes that their collective genome encodes, it's 100 times more genes than our human genome encodes. So, the, so as humans, we are an ecosystem made up of microbial parts and human parts. And from a gene standpoint, we're actually more microbial than we are humans. We like to, in the lab, we like to think of, our, of humans as a, an elaborate culturing vessel. We're just a tube <laughs> to house these bacteria. <laughs> And what we're finding, and has been discovered over the past decade, is that these microbes are wired into all aspects of our biology. They're not just helping with digestion. They're wired into our central nervous system and our immune system. And this wiring is profound, and we think that it's important for the future of health. So my husband and I started studying this community of bacteria about 15 years ago, and 15 years ago, the microbiota really was just a scientific curiosity. There were, we knew there were a lot of bacteria living in the gut. We had a sense they were helping with digestion. But beyond that, we didn't really understand what they were doing. In the lab, we were studying these um, germ-free mice. So this is an isolator. We have mice that live in there. And this is a way of keeping the environment completely sterile. And we have mice in there that we call germ-free mice. They don't have any associated bacteria in them at all. They're completely clean. And what we found from studying these, mi these germ-free mice is that they were different from normal mice that have bacteria in their gut. How were they different? The one thing they, the people that were working these mice started realizing is that these mice could eat a lot more food than normal mice, but they weren't gaining any weight. They were leaner. And so we thought, well, that kind of makes sense. I guess these bacteria, they're helping us digest our food. And so if they're not there, we're maybe not extracting as many calories. But then the lab started doing some interesting experiments to see if, if there was maybe more to it than that. So we had these mice that didn't have any bacteria in their gut at all. And we had a collection of obese mice and then a collection of just normal lean mice. And we took the bacteria from the obese mice and we put it in these um, germ-free mice. So now they have an obese microbiota. And then we also put lean micro, li, mice, microbes from lean mice into these 
germ-free mice. And what people in the lab were finding was that if you transplanted the obese microbiota into these mice, they gained a lot more weight than if you transferred in the microbiota of a lean mouse. And these mice were eating the exact same food. Same amount of calories, same food. And so this idea that, you know, we have this idea of calories that go in versus what you spend, that's how much weight you gain, but this kind of threw a wrench into that. It's more than that. It's not just calories in. There's this ecosystem inside of us, and it's deciding how those calories are being used or if they're being stored. So when this came out, this was in 2006, 10 years ago. We were, we were in the lab at the time, and the microbiota changed from being a scientific curiosity to what it's become today, which is, in my opinion, the, the center of the biomedical endeavor. These microbes, there was a realization that these microbes were fundamental to who we are as humans. Since then, they've done other transplants. They've taken microbiota from obese humans and they put them into mice. Those mice gain more weight than if you take a microbiota from a lean human. And obese humans and lean humans have a distinct uh, microbiota composition. And now there's a bunch of ongoing trials to determine if a microbiota transplant could be beneficial, not only for weight loss, but for a number of other diseases. I think right now there's something like 127 open trials looking at whether or not modulating the microbiota can cure or help a number of diseases. What we found over the past decade is that the intestinal microbiota controls metabolism and obesity. It's been linked to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic syndrome. It is profoundly wired into our immune system. What happens in your gut and the immune system that, that your gut contains is listening to the microbes, responding to the microbes that are there, and then it is traveling throughout your entire body. It's influencing how your body responds to not only intestinal infections, but also respiratory infections and, and any other infections that you would have. It's been associated with autoimmune diseases, cancer, allergies, and asthma. And more recently, there's been a connection observed between the intestinal microbiota, brain behavior, and personality. This is very new. This is something that's just happened over the past couple years. And there's been links to the microbiota and depression, autism spectrum disorders, and multiple sclerosis. The details of all these connections are what our lab is interested in trying to figure out. So the problem, we have a situation in the Western world where we have chronic diseases that are rising at alarming rates. If you look at over the past 50 years, the incidence of immune disorders is rising rapidly and the uh, incidence of adult obesity, there's some estimations by that by 2030, 50% of the US population will be obese. This is a huge problem for Western medicine. Unfortunately, um, as our lifestyle spreads across the globe, it's becoming a big problem globally. Now over, 50, over half of deaths around the world are from non-communicable communicable chronic diseases. Cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and diabetes are major killers now. And it's not just a health issue, it's a uh, an economic issue. Chronic diseases are estimated to cost the global economy on the order of $47 trillion. So this is a problem that we need to solve and we need to get in front of before it becomes a, a, big, a bigger global issue than it already has become. So Western medicine um, is very good at treating acute illnesses and has struggled with chronic diseases. And a lot of the what Western medicine can do is sort of trim the branches of these chronic diseases, treating symptoms, but not necessarily getting to the root of the problem. I love this cartoon. It says here, great news, Captain. You can inform the passengers we have slowed the rate of sinking. And this is what, <laughs> this is what I feel like is, is happening with Western disease. We're, we're, we're trying to get at the, the manifestations of the disease and not necessarily the cause. So our lab is very interested in understanding the root causes. We wanna know what is causing these alarming trends that we're seeing. And we're interested, are there many different causes that are contributing equally? Or might there be a few causes that explain most of the increase? The interesting thing is you see as these diseases go up, as obesity goes up, it's all going up in synchrony. Is it possible that there is 
potentially a unifying theory that would explain all of these, uh, this increase in disease that we're seeing. Lots of things have changed. Our diet is different, sedentary lifestyle, hygiene, antibiotic strain chemicals. All these things could be contributing. But we think that a lot of these new things that we're experiencing could be functioning through our microbiota and that problems with the microbiota could be a unifying cause or contributor of chronic disease. You think of yourself as, um, you know, this entity that has a lot of control, but in reality, your microbes are in many ways controlling your health and your physiology. Which is good news because, unlike our human genome, our microbiome is malleable. So if you are born with a genetic defect, as of now, you are stuck with that genetic defect for the rest of your life. Your microbiota, however, you're not stuck with. This is something that we assemble upon birth, and if you change what you eat today, your microbiota will be different tomorrow. We can measure it and see it. Antibiotic use, all these things change the microbiota. So it's good news in that it puts a lot of power back into our hands that we can change 99% of our associated genetic material we have some control over. But it can also change in a negative way, and so we just have to be mindful that that can happen. There are challenges with using the microbiota as a therapeutic um, target. Each person's microbiota is unique. Each one of us has a different collection of microbes that inhabit our gut. There's a lot of similarities, but it's as unique as our fingerprint. And so therapies that we develop to help one person with type 2 diabetes may not help somebody else with that same disease and most certainly will not help people with a different disease. So from a therapeutic standpoint, it's, it's a complicated problem and there'll be a lot of challenges um, associated with that. The microbiota is incredibly complex. Trillions of microbes, like I said, hundreds of species. It's a complexity that I think rivals the brain. Trying to figure out what all these different microbes are doing, how they're interacting with each other, how they're interacting with our biology is a complex problem. And then there's issues with regulation. The FDA is really set up to regulate drugs that are small molecules or chemicals. And we're talking about developing drugs that might be living organisms. How do you regulate that? What if I take that organism and it becomes 90% of my microbiota? How would I get rid of that? How would I keep that from happening? What if I take that microbe and it becomes 90% of my microbiota, but in somebody else, it just passes through? So it, dosage is an issue and individual responses are an issue. So there are many challenges. I think there's a lot of promise in the field, but we have to be mindful that a lot of this promise is gonna take decades to realize. So now I just wanna talk a little bit about the links between microbiota and our health and disease. So a little bit about how we acquire our microbes. We, when we are born, we're largely like those germ-free mice in the bubbles that I showed you almost completely devoid of bacteria. When we're born, though, we enter this world that is a microbial world. There are microbes everywhere. As much as we try to sanitize everything, and we do a pretty good job at that, there are still bacteria everywhere. There's a um, professor that we work with, Stan Falco, that has this famous expression that I love, which is, the world is covered in a patina of shit. <laughs> he is right. There are, <laughs> there are bacteria everywhere. So when you were born, you come in contact with these microbes through your parents, through uh, interactions that you have with other people, pets, outside, and that's how you get colonized. Each of our microbiota is unique, but it has a family resemblance. So it does look more like your mother than it would like somebody else's mother. It does look more like your family members than strangers. And these microbes have been traveling with our species for millions of years. There's evidence that the microbes that we have in our gut, we have got from our ancestors dating back to before we were humans. So these bacteria are fundamental to who we are as a species. So what does the microbiota do? The microbiota is often referred to as the forgotten organ, and it truly is like an organ. It has a function similar to how we think of like what the heart does or the liver does, but its function is to digest dietary fiber. So when you eat food that has dietary fiber, it goes through the digestive system 
through the small intestine into the colon where most of our bacteria live. That picture that I showed you was the colon. It's a dense community of microbes. The complex carbohydrates that are found in dietary fiber, the bacteria ferment this, they break these bonds down, and then they have waste products. Some of those waste products get absorbed into our bloodstream and circulate throughout our body. Our human genome has about 17 different genes to degrade dietary fiber. Our microbiome has on the order of 60 to 100,000 genes to digest dietary fiber. So it is clear that as a species, we have outsourced the function of dietary fiber digestion to our microbes. They are in charge of, of this job for us, and that's what makes them an organ. Those waste products that I told you that the microbes secrete and enter into our circulation, here's a small collection of some of the ones that have been identified. This is in collaboration with a lab up at UCSF. What's striking is many of these compounds look like drugs. Uh, our collaborator up at UCSF likes to call our microbiota the unsupervised drug factory. It is making compounds in our gut. These compounds are going into our blood. They're circulating throughout our system. Most of them, we have no idea what they're doing. And so we're very interested in figuring out what these compounds are doing and if some of them could be therapeutic. So um, our lab is concerned about the lack of dietary fiber in the Western diet. If the microbiota is an organ for degrading dietary fiber and you look at the Western diet, we eat a pretty sad amount of dietary fiber. There's a journalist that we've spent a lot of time talking to, Moises Velasquez Manoff. He wrote an article about our lab in this uh, magazine, Nautilus. It's available online. So I'm going to put things like this up. So if you guys are interested in reading more about it, you can find them. This is titled, How the Western Diet Has Derailed Our Evolution. Burgers and fries have nearly killed our ancestral microbiome. Our lab is very interested in the effects of our diet on this community of bacteria that's so fundamental to our health. Humans have been on the planet for about 200,000 years. 190,000 of those years, all of our food came from hunting and gathering. So most of our time on this planet, we've been foragers. 10,000 years ago, we invented agriculture. That resulted in a huge shift in how we obtained calories. And over the past 50 to 100 years, our diet has shifted to one that's mostly processed and sanitized food. Now, with each advent in food technology, we've reduced the amount of dietary fiber we consume. If you look at hunter-gatherer populations that are still around today, they eat on the order of 100 to 150 grams of dietary fiber per day. Populations that eat and live a lifestyle similar to our early agrarian ancestors, they eat 35 grams of dietary fiber per day. The average American eats 15. What does this mean for an organ whose job is to degrade, to degrade dietary fiber if you're not feeding it? These are the Hadza of Tanzania. They are a hunter-gatherer population that we study. This population is incredibly interesting because not only do they live a lifestyle like our ancestors did for most of our time on this planet, but they're living that lifestyle in the cradle of human evolution. They're living where humans evolved in East Africa. And these people are incredibly interesting. Their society is incredibly interesting. It's very egalitarian. Nobody's in charge. Everybody makes decisions all together. And they don't store food at all. They wake up every morning completely confident that they will be able to forage and gather the food that they need for that day. So they wake up in the morning. The men will go out with bows and arrows. They're still using bows and arrows. They have um, a special poison that they extract from a, a flower that they tip they put on the tip of their arrows to kill game. And then the women go out and do the foraging. They forage for tubers. That's what is cooking here. This is, these wild tubers are like the ancestors of our potatoes. But unlike our potatoes, they're incredibly fibrous, as you can see here. They chew these things forever and then eventually end up spitting a lot of the fibers out because it, they're just so fibrous. They also forage for berries. The men will go out and get honey as well. If you look at what their diet is like, 
the tubers are their staple they rely on that they get that every day they can count on that food many days that is the majority of what they eat they'll also get berries if they're in season the men will go out and hunt but often the hunting is unsuccessful every once in a while they'll get a big game maybe a zebra they'll eat that entire zebra in one day 15,000 calories they can eat in a day but that's because there are many days that they don't get meat at all. So, so in that way, you know, the, their diet is highly variable, but their, their high fiber tubers are their staple. So we have in our lab right now a collection of over 500 stool samples from these individuals. We've looked at their microbiota over various seasons of, of men, women, children, um, and what we're wondering is what their microbiota looks like, because since we don't have a time machine, we have no way to look back in time and see what our microbiota was like for most of our evolution. So we use these people as a proxy for that. Other labs also study traditional populations, and so there have been other studies looking at the composition of their microbiota. What we find is that our population in Tanzania and, another, and other populations that are either hunter-gatherers or live in early agrarian lifestyle have a composition that's highly similar to one another. They have types of microbes in their gut that we never see in Western guts at all. They have many more bacteria in their gut than we do. Diversity of species is much higher. If you look at Western populations, we're all over here. So there appears to be two different, popula or two different compositions that we see, the Western microbiota this traditional population. The interesting thing about the traditional population is this includes individuals both from Africa and South America. These are people that have not shared a common ancestor in over 10,000 years, and yet their microbiota looks more like each other than it looks like ours. And that we feel like that is, is concerning. Here's an example of um, the type of data that we look at in our lab. Each black line here represents a different type of bacteria that we see in their gut sample. And then the coloring just tells us how abundant it is. Green is less abundant, yellow is medium abundant, red means it's highly abundant in the gut. And so our population in Tanzania has many different kinds of microbes. That's all the little black lines. This is a, two populations, one from Malawi and Venezuela. These aren't hunter-gatherers, but they're early agrarian. Um, they live an early agrarian lifestyle. And they also have lots of different types of bacteria in their gut. And then here are the Americans. There are all these bacteria here that these two populations have that we just don't see in our guts anymore. And our lab is interested in understanding those bacteria, what they're doing. Might they be protective against Western diseases? These traditional populations don't suffer from obesity, they don't have type 2 diabetes, and many of the autoimmune diseases that we have in the West are, don't exist over there. I like to think, when I, when I look at a microbiota of a, traditional, of a person living a traditional lifestyle, it kind of reminds me of this lush landscape, lots of different species, very robust, uh, healthy looking environment. When I look at the microbiota composition of the average Westerner, it reminds me of this. Species missing, it looks a little bit desolate. And so what's happened? What has happened between these traditional populations and us now? Many things could have happened. There's a lot of differences between the way we live our life and the way they live theirs. Antibi oops. Antibiotics are highly common, vaccinations, Sanitation, I mean, our, this population we study in Tanzania, when they need water, they go out to this river where animals are using as a bathroom or people are washing in and they drink that water. They're okay with that. Um, it would make all of us very sick. Um, they don't have baby formula, C-section, and then their diet is very different. All these things undoubtedly are contributing to why our microbiota looks different from theirs. But what our lab was interested in is, is diet alone, might diet alone be enough to, see, to account for some of these differences that we see? So back in the lab, we took our um, mice that live in the bubbles. These mice have no microbes in their gut at all, and we give them a human microbiota. We call these humanized mice. So they are the closest approximation that we have to a human. 
as far as the microbiome is concerned and what we do is what we did was we we put these mice on a low fiber diet and we specifically wanted to know what would happen to that mouse's microbiota over several generations we know that if you change the diet of a mouse the microbiota will change but what happens if that change occurs over many generations much like what would have happened in human history we also had a control group of mice that we maintained on a high fiber diet for four generations. What did we see? So here's the experiment. Each line across is a, an individual mouse, and each box is a species of bacteria that we detected in their gut. How that box is shaded tells us how abundant that particular type of bacteria is in that mouse's gut. So here's the initial community. Over four generations, there's a little bit of loss of bacteria, but for the most part, the community remains stable. These are the mice on the high fiber diet. Here are the mice on the low fiber diet. Here's the initial community. Generation one, they've lost microbes. Generation two, even more. Generation three and four, massive loss of microbes. This last group here, we put back on a high fiber diet to see if we could recover the bacteria. They, they don't come back. They're gone permanently from the system. We published this last year in Nature. Uh, we, we titled it Diet-Induced in Extinctions in the Gut Microbiota Compound Over Generations. We think this is a model of potentially what has happened, what we're seeing in these traditional populations versus Westerner. They have microbes in their gut we don't have. Maybe our change in diet has made these microbes extinct over generations. Even if we switch back to a high fiber diet, all these microbes are probably not going to come back. We have this model for how the Western diet starves our microbiota. The Western diet is high in simple carbohydrates. This was the top part that I showed, high fiber diet. Microbes are happy fermenting these, these complex carbohydrates. They release this, one of the molecules they release is called short chain fatty acids. That gets absorbed into our circulation. We know that short chain fatty acids help depress uh, the immune, calm the immune system down. In the Western world, we're eating a simple carb diet. Those simple carbohydrates are easily absorbed early in the digestive system. The human gut is very good at extracting things like sugar. So if you're not eating high fiber, then the microbes that have no food because all these simple carbs are absorbed early. So what happens? Do they just sit there waiting? What do they do? We wanted to know. So we have mice again with a human microbiota. This is similar to the picture that I showed you. These are all the bacteria on this side, these little red and green um, dots here. This, is, this yellow thing is actually a piece of dietary. This is a, a cell wall. This is dietary fiber. So you can see the bacteria all around there eating it. Here's the mucus layer. Here's the intestinal cells. That mucus layer is what keeps them from us. We developed software in our lab to quantify how thick that mucus layer is. So this is a line drawn by a program. It does measurements all along the colon and can tell us the thickness of that mucus layer. What happens when we put mice on a low fiber diet? You can tell they're on a low fiber diet because you don't see that plant material, that's all gone. What was striking is this mucus layer was noticeably thinner, about half the thickness of the high fiber diet. When we saw this, we thought the, the thing that came to mind was this good fences makes good neighbors. And here's an example of not a good fence. The microbes, you can tell, are getting closer to the intestinal cells. And wh why is that a problem? Our intestinal cells are constantly monitoring the microbes that are there. These microbes are healthy, but if they get into our bloodstream, that's problematic. They can cause sepsis. So our immune system is constantly just making sure, let's make this mucus layer, let's make sure they stay where they're supposed to be and that we're safe over here. When microbes start encroaching, the, the intestinal cells know. They say, wait a minute, these bacteria, they're getting close. This is getting dangerous. We're concerned that they're going to infiltrate our barrier that we've, we've erected here. And so we are going to start an inflammatory response. We got to push these microbes further away and, and keep ourselves safe. 
and that does keep ourselves safe from an acute infection. What it doesn't do is when you have years, months, years, decades of chronic inflammation from this tiny mucus layer, this is the seed of Western disease. All these diseases that are going up in the Western world, at their core, they're diseases that are from chronic inflammation, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, all these autoimmune diseases could all be a result of these microbes getting too close and inciting inflammation in the gut. We, we wrote this perspective a couple years ago in cell metabolism, starving our microbial self, the deleterious consequence of a diet deficient in microbiota accessible carbohydrates. When we started doing this research, my husband and I started getting very concerned because, you know, we, we are Westerners. We have these microbes in our guts too. And we were thinking, you know, the implications of what we were seeing for the health of so many people was so profound that we felt like we really needed to, um, to spread the word about what we were seeing. We have this model for what we think has happened to the microbiota over time. When we were hunter gatherers, for 190,000 years, we had this diverse, rich ecosystem living in our gut. With each advent in food technology, that ecosystem has been destroyed, and we're at a point now where it's um, a fraction of what it used to be, and we're concerned that this is uh, causing a lot of Western disease. How do we get it back to where it was? Can we do dietary change? Can we reintroduce species? These are all things that we're studying in our lab and interested in finding solutions for. We have this human genome that evolves relatively slowly, but we have this microbiome that can change on a daily basis, depending on what you've eaten. If for 190,000 years we ate a certain way, our genome would get used to the microbiota that's there, and they would start interacting, and um, kind of like this, this lock and key idea, in a way that's beneficial. If we change the diet rapidly, which is what we've done, then that microbiota composition has changed and our human genome can't adapt as rapidly. So we're concerned that there's, been, there's now an incompatibility between our human genome, which is more ancient, and our microbiome, which is new. We know that dietary fiber is associated with health. This is nothing new. Here is an analysis, a meta-analysis that was done. They took 17 different perspective studies that had a total of 76,000 deaths. Almost a million people were included in the study. And what they found was a 10% reduction in all-cause mortality risk for every 10 grams per day of increase in fiber. If we, there's been other studies showing that people that have, um, they did, 300 microbiotas, roughly, of Europeans. People fell into two categories, either low microbiota composition, low diversity, or high diversity. They found that people that had low diversity had increased adiposity, increased cholesterol, inflammation, higher insulin resistance, all bad news for the low microbiota composition, or low diversity people. They put these people on a high fiber diet that also in, um, included reduction in calorie. The people in the low diversity group actually increased their microbiota diversity. And when their microbiota diversity increased, they had all kinds of clinical improvements, decreased adiposity, improved insulin sensitivity, decreased triglycerides, and decreased inflammation. So this is evidence that in humans, if you change your diet, if you increase the diversity of the microbes in your gut, you can improve your health. We know that dietary fiber protects against Western disease. What we're figuring out is how that's working, and we think that that's working through increased diversity and metabolic output of your microbiota. This idea of fiber being healthy is something that we've heard about for decades. The difference now is we're starting to understand why, why it's so helpful. My husband and I started the center at Stanford, the Center for Human Microbiome Studies. We're trying to translate the work that we've done into humans. We've started human trials where we give people um, high fiber diets, high fermented food diets. 
we're following their microbiota over these dietary interventions, and we're also following huge number of immune system parameters. We're measuring everything that you can in the human immune system, and we're trying to figure out, do these changes in diet affect the microbiota, and is that changing the immune status of the host, in this case, humans? Okay, now I'm gonna talk about probiotics because it's something that everybody always asks me about and has lots of questions of. One thing I wanna say about probiotics is that there's this misconception out there that if you take a probiotic, that the microbes in that probiotic live in your gut. They don't. Most of these organisms are transient members. They're a, most probiotics that you buy off the shelf came from yogurt or other fermented foods. They're adapted to those foods. They like to live in yogurt. They don't like to live in the human gut. Now, that doesn't mean they're not doing anything. They just don't populate your gut. The, the bacteria that are living there long-term are the ones that you got as children. So just clear up that misconception. There's two major ways of getting probiotics, either through fermented foods or supplements. The fermented food and supplement aisle for probiotics is completely overwhelming. It's like exploded. I mean, the yogurt section alone is just like unbelievable. And then forget the probiotic section. It's impossible to navigate that. And so my hope is that um, I can give you some tips or ideas or, or ways of, of thinking about these different things. What is a probiotic? How is it defined? It's defined as live microorganisms, which when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit to the host. That definition has evolved over time to one that is more that when we conclude that when evidence is sufficient to support the concept of potentially beneficial, like live microbes, which some plausible benefits are reasonable to in, in, expect, <laughs> including strains of microbes that have not been specifically tested for health benefits, but are members of a well-studied group. So to be considered a probiotic, you don't have to show that it has a benefit, but just that it is reasonable to expect that it would have a benefit. So what are the, there are pros and cons to both of these things. Fermented foods, one of their major pros is that they provide external digestion of your food. So you think of something like milk, has a lot of lactose, that's a type of sugar. If you add microbes to it, the bacteria ferment the lactose and turn it into lactic acid. So in that fermentation product, they have lowered the glycemic index of milk. So now instead of getting the lactose, which if you're not lactose intolerant, your body can use, instead you're getting lactic acid, not as much sugar, doesn't raise your, um, isn't as high of a glycemic index. Um, but it can't be cooked or canned. These are living organisms. If you cook or can them, you kill them. Um, often the composition and density of the microbial community is unknown. They write stuff on the label. We've checked it in the lab. It's not always what they say. Um, and then you have to watch out for salt and sugar. That yogurt aisle is like a minefield of sugar. If you read some of the labels on there, I mean, some of the sugar in that yogurt rivals that of soda. So you just have to be careful that, and, and unfortunately they couch it as a health food because pro living organism, probiotic, but, but they can have some other uh, unhealthy things. I always look for this live and active cultures label. That means that at least at the time of manufacture, there were living organisms in the, in the fermented food. Okay, probiotic supplements. There's a convenience as far as the dosage. Many of them will write how many organisms are there. It's not a guarantee that all those organisms are alive, but at least it's something. Um, and then they don't have any added calories, so it's an easy thing to take. The probiotic supplements, like all supplements in the United States, are unregulated. There is no body to police whether or not what is written on the label is accurate, that any of those microbes are alive, or that they are doing anything. The claims that, they're, that they write on there are overseen by the FDA. They are not allowed to write things on there that claim to treat or cure disease. They can only put what they call stru structure function claims, promotes a healthy digestion or promotes a healthy immune system. Um, and 
so and then many are mislabeled contaminated not viable there is this u s p symbol that means that the probiotic company has used a third party to verify that what they write on the label is accurate that is usually a sign that it's a quality probiotic um, but again you know it's not a guarantee so what is somebody to do that wants to use uh, probiotics to find a product that's right for you if say you just want to maintain health prevent infectious disease or aid in digestion or of motility then we feel like the best thing to do is to find a food or a product that agrees with your system. Everybody's microbiota is different, so depending on your system, a probiotic that might be right for you might be a disaster for you. And so you just have to kind of be your own experimentalist and see, what can you look for? If you're already healthy, it's not easy to know what to look for. The most obvious thing is bowel movements. If you see an improvement of your regularity or ease of passing stool, that's an indication that the probiotic is providing some benefit. What if you want to treat a health issue like um, IBS? Then probably the best thing to do is to go into the scientific literature and see if there have been human studies done for your condition with a probiotic and then look for that probiotic because most of those studies are funded by the probiotic industry they want to make them available to people. You can try those first because there's at least some validation. But again, it has to be, you sort of have to be your own experimentalist and see what seems to work for ameliorating your, your symptoms and, and agrees with your system. You have to be mindful if you have a serious medical issue. Their probiotics in general are extremely safe, but if you're immune compromised, they could, um, they could be a problem. So you just want to consult with your physician if you're going to try probiotics. The probiotics of the future will extend well beyond what's available now. Most of the strains that you can purchase are from fermented foods. Like I said, they're transient. They don't colonize the gut. There are a couple strains that sort of got grandfathered in that were derived from the human gut, these bifidobacterium strains and lactobacillus GG. Those, um, depending on your system may take up residence. They will never be large components of your microbiota, um, but they, they could stay there more long term. But our lab is interested in other probiotics that would be um, provide a, be a better benefit and um, maybe be more reliable. There are also unique products. This is a company that sells probiotics that the microbes were derived from soil. They've done a handful of little studies, show some benefit. Something to think if you if you if it's something that you want to try. There's a microbe that actually they found that people that had this microbe were less likely to get kidney stones. Turns out this microbe digests oxalate, which can form kidney stones. So if you have this microbe, it's a way of getting rid of oxalates. People are looking into using that as a probiotic um, for people to have. And then fecal microbiota transplant pills. I'm sure most of you have heard of what fecal microbiota transplant. If you haven't, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, and the way that fecal microbiota transplants are done right now are usually either via enema or a nasogastric tube. Companies are trying to develop little capsules that you could take that would repopulate your gut. It sounds disgusting, but if you have suffered from um, ulcerative colitis as a result of a C. diff infection, this is a godsend for these people. This is an example of uh, a microbiota reboot that has completely changed the way that recurrent C. difficile is um, treated, and it's highly effective. So what can we do now? I didn't talk a bunch about kids, but um, the microbiota of children is incredibly important. Whenever I get a chance, I try to write articles that appeal to a large group of people to get this information out there. This is an article that I wrote for Parents Magazine, Five Ways to Boost Your Kid's Gut Health. What do we know? It's all the same things I told you. Feed your microbes, dietary fiber. Kids need to be eating dietary fiber. Their microbiota is developing still. This is the community they're going to have for their entire lives. Eat bacteria, fermented foods, or probiotics. Don't over sanitize. This is something that is, it's difficult to, because sanitation, there is no doubt, has saved 
number, uh, you know, innumerable lives. We don't want to go back to having to deal with the diseases associated with not having sanitized water or an environment. But I think all these things um, are a result of us viewing microbes as bad things. And I think what we're realizing is there are bad microbes, but there are good microbes. And we just have to be aware of that. And so when you're in an environment where you feel like you've been in contact maybe with bad microbes, say like on a an area where there would be a lot of people around. So like in a train or, you know, in a physician's office, then you want to sanitize. But in situations where you're just like petting the family dog, you don't need to go and rush and wash your hands right away before you eat. And that is a way of getting more microbes incorporated into our system. Avoid unnecessary antibiotics. Again, antibiotics are a wonder drug. They've saved tons of lives, but antibiotics were developed at a time where we didn't really understand what the microbes in our gut were doing. Most of these antibiotics that are available today are broad spectrum. They kill the bad microbes, they decimate the good microbes. Until we have very precise antibiotics that only go after the bad ones, we have to be careful when we use these and be mindful that when we do need them, that our resident healthy gut bacteria have been harmed and we need to increase our dietary fiber consumption, maybe increase our probiotic consumption until that community has a chance to rebuild. And then expose yourself to nature's microbes. Get out in nature and there's a reason why I think that gardening usually makes people feel happy. You're interacting with dirt and bacteria that it gets incorporated into our system and is probably helpful. I have two children, that's my husband and my two girls. This is an article that Stanford Medicine wrote about us. Eating a high fiber diet is, is the culture in our home. The same way that when we get in the car, we put our seatbelts on. Nobody questions it, nobody complains about it because that's just what it is. Every meal, there's lots of vegetables, there's lots of grains, there's lots of legumes. If my girls aren't happy about it, they know that the next meal is going to be the same, so they just <laughs> will eat it. There's no, there's no option. And, and I can say that, you know, they've, they've come to love and expect that food. This is the food that they were raised on. This is the food that they're used to eating. So it, it's not a battle um, at, that you would think. We've changed our front yard and turned it into a vegetable garden. I feel like when my girls grow the food themselves, they're way more likely to want to eat it and talk about how tasty it is. We had a journalist a couple years ago come and spend a weekend at our house. He wrote an article about us in um, New York Magazine. Um, and then a photographer came and spread manure all over our table and took this picture. We don't normally eat with manure on our table. <laughs> but we do eat with the, you know, this amount of, of plants. In the, the article, I thought was very interesting to hear this person's take on our life. He said in the article that we are making a commitment to fiber consumption that today borders on the comical. And I found that very interesting because I look at these traditional populations that we study that eat 100 and 150 grams of dietary fiber per day. Our family is getting nowhere near it. We're eating probably on our best day, 50 grams of dietary fiber. If you look at what the recommended amount is, like 38 to 45 grams of dietary fiber per day. So the fact that he found that comical really made me think that our diet has, has gone so far from what it should be that even something that looks somewhat like what we're supposed to be eating looks ridiculous to somebody. Um, and I think that's kind of sad. So what does increasing dietary fiber and changing your lifestyle look like? When we started the lab, we needed a sample to humanize our germ-free mice with. And so we thought, well, we'll take my husband's sample. He will always be a part of the lab. And we know we can come back to him for more samples. So we used that for our experiments. You know, as part of the experiment, we had to see what his original composition looked like. He had about a little over 600 species of bacteria in his gut. We didn't think anything of it back in 2010. We finally, in 2015, ran out of that sample. And we said, hey, we need, we need another sample from you. He gave us another sample. And we found that he had increased his, comp his diversity almost a third again. So he was up to 
eleven hundred species of microbes over that time period what did he what did we do over that time period like i said we changed our front yard into a garden we eat so many more plants than we used to this is my kids playing in a um, turkey compost pile um, <laughs> we're just so much more relaxed about things like that now before we would have been like oh you got to wash your hands and now we're, we we try to be more calm in situations where we feel like it's safe. This is an example of a pizza that we'll make. We um, make our own kefir, so we're fermenting stuff. And then we got a dog. And pets are a great way to expose yourself to the outside. Our dog goes outside, he comes and sits on our couch. And you know, so there, there are bacteria everywhere. And so this is, you know, N equals one. We didn't set this up as an experiment. It just happened that we had this old sample and new sample, and we had changed our lifestyle pretty dramatically. But I think it does show that it's at least possible to increase the diversity of your microbiota and, and um, to, a, to a better spot just through simple things like diet. Three take-home messages. The Western gut microbiota has low diversity, which is associated with poor health. Dietary fiber, or max, these microbiota accessible carbohydrates, can help retain and increase that microbiota diversity. We joke at our house that we eat a Big Mac diet, lots of <laughs> microbiota associated carbohydrates. Um, and then fermented foods and probiotics have been shown to have health benefits and can help increase diversity and are um, something to try. Okay, so one last thing. Um, when the, I'm gonna sh totally shift gears here. When the, when the new proposal for the NIH budget came out and there was this talk of severe cuts to the NIH, I decided to add this slide into my talks because I felt like as a member of the scientific community, I could, it's on me to explain in situations where I have an opportunity how our research is funded. And I think the scientific community in general has done a poor job of explaining how research is funded and how we rely on this money. And so I think it's our responsibility to educate people on how um, we do research in our lab. Almost all the money that funds our research is from the National Institute of Health, and then we have this other National Science Foundation money. This is all federal money. We get a s small slice from nonprofit foundations. And then um, more recently, we've been um, doing private donors and industry funding as well. A few years ago, that yellow slice would have been nothing um, because we would have been completely reliant. We feel like now that isn't a good strategy moving forward um, because we have to we feel like it's important to keep our research going, and so we have to look at all sources of funding. Now, federal funding is incredibly important for research like what we do because a lot of what we're finding is that safe components of food, like dietary fiber, are beneficial. No company wants to fund that because food is not patentable. You can't make money off of um, any, any dietary supplement that has a particular type of fiber somebody else could come up with something that's a teeny bit different and it would probably be just as effective. Um, and then it keeps our research honest. We're not, when we get private funding from a corporation, say, that wants us to use their probiotic, we, we make sure that the company understands that we will publish the finding regardless of what it is and that, um, that, um, that we'll publish a finding regardless of what it is and that um, we, we will not be, we won't have this sense of showing them a result that they want to see just to get more funding. So what that normally means is that most companies do not want to fund our research because the biggest concern for, say, a probiotic company is if they give us money, we use their probiotic in a human study and there's no effect. We will publish that and that's, a PR nightmare for them. So often we, we have had very strained relationships with, with industry. Sometimes we will get companies that are very forward thinking and they want to improve their product and are happy funding and figuring whatever we figure out, we're happy to um, share with them and share with everyone. 
okay, so finally, i want to acknowledge the members of our lab. we have this incredible group of people at stanford that range from m d s to computer scientists we feel like ah we have to really approach this complex problem from many different facets and that's why we've we've assembled this group of people we felt so strongly about the research that we were doing and its importance in human health and realized that when we would talk to our other science friends that weren't even us that weren't working on the microbiota and our friends our educated friends that didn't know about our research we saw that we were raising our kids and making choices that were different than what they were doing. We had this privileged access to this knowledge that other people didn't have. And then we would go to conferences where it's all microbiota scientists, and we saw that what we were doing, they were all doing too. We had all come to the same conclusion that high fiber diets were good, fermented foods were good, um, this overuse of antibiotics and, and sanitation was had gone too far. And so we felt very strongly that we had to convey this information in a way that would be accessible to everybody, and that's the impetus for writing this book. We wrote that book with the idea of spreading the information of our lab and other researchers in this field in a way that was scientifically sound, evidence-based, but also easy for, for anybody to read. And so I would like to um, offer up if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, <laughs> lots of questions already. <laughs> they say when they turn 50, their metabolism changes, their things slow down, they gain a lot of weight. Um, and often they don't change their diet, and on the contrary, they try and become a little bit more healthy. Um, so I'm just wondering if, in fact, you've looked into something like that and how that may... Um, what research you may have found. Yeah, uh, the field is very, for the last 10 years, was very much in like a stamp collecting phase. I mean, we really didn't know what types of bacteria were typical in a human gut. And so we've spent the last 10 years cataloging that everywhere. And one of the things we found, and by we I mean the community of researchers, not necessarily our lab specifically, is that as we age, the microbiota does change in composition. And if you look at people like, you know, over 70, 80, their microbiota composition looks completely different than somebody that's in their 30s or 40s. We don't know what that means. Some of these microbes that we see that become more abundant later in life appear to be microbes that are not beneficial, that result in more inflammation. But we don't, we don't know what, what's caused, is that just aging? Is there something else happening that's causing that? and um, whether or not that's something that we could slow down, is, again, we don't know. So it's possible that this shift in community is what's making you know, weight gain and those kinds of things easier as you get older. It's clear that the microbes that we inhabit are largely determining things like how our metabolism works. But we, beyond just knowing that there's a difference there, we don't know much. I'm curious about the effects of caffeine, perhaps, on the gut um, in the digestive process, went through coffee or tea? Yes. I mean, caffeine results in motility changes in a lot of people. And we know that you're, a large part of the community that you have in your gut is a product of your system. So depending on how often you have bowel movements will influence which type of microbes inhabit your gut. And so in sort of an indirect way, it could have a r effect on your community. Whether or not caffeine, like that molecule specifically, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that. But you know, the field is rapidly growing and people are looking at things like artificial sweeteners, uh, chlorinated water, like all these things that we're ingesting, what influence that has on the microbiota, in many cases, you see a difference. If that difference is meaningful, we don't know. Did that tribe have caffeine in their diet? Uh, let me think. They will, so they live nearby a group of pastureless that have access to tea. And so they will drink tea periodically, but for the most part, they don't. Not daily. Yeah, <laughs> not daily. Okay, so. For me, I would just like clarification so I don't leave confused. 
your slides in the beginning led me, my perception was that I couldn't change. Yeah. So, so this is why I'm so confused at the mm -hmm. moment, honestly, because the first slide where you said unless we were to get a transplant, I couldn't change it, mm -hmm. or it didn't, studies haven't shown yet. Yeah. And then the slide where after generation four, you gave them back the fiber, nothing changed. Yeah. But then you showed your husband at the end, so I'm mm -hmm. like, oh wait, maybe I can. Yeah, yeah. So okay. can you clarify? Yes, yes. So, okay, Thank so the, the mouse experiment, remember they're done in the, those bubbles. Uh -huh. So bacteria can really only leave. We've enclosed them in a system where there's no opportunity for new bacteria to come in. So what we were testing when we added the fiber back was maybe there were reserves of microbes in their gut that we weren't detecting that if we fed them, they would come back, which didn't happen. So those, that's why we said extinction. They were gone. My husband's example, he lives in the microbial world. So if he, when he increased his fiber consumption, increased exposure with bacteria, we can, you know, the patina, get microbes from other individuals, and if we have a lifestyle that is amenable to those microbes living in our gut, they can take residence. And that's what we think happened with my husband. Now, for the, there are kind of two things happening. The Western microbiota is less diverse than these traditional populations. Those microbes that they have that we never see here, we so far have no way of getting them unless we would go to Tanzania and hang out with those people. So part of what our lab is studying is these microbes, can we reintroduce them into people in a safe way? That's a big question we don't know. We have to be very careful. Some of these microbes might cause diseases in Westerners. And so that's kind of one thing of regaining this like ancestral microbes, but because we can't do that in a safe way now, what can we do now? We can increase the microbes that are in our environment. So from interacting with different people, interacting with the environment, increasing the dietary fiber, you can increase the diversity of your microbiota. You will not get some of these microbes that these traditional populations have, but maybe you don't need those. Maybe increasing the diversity of just the, the microbial pool that we have access to is enough. What happens when we eat um, meat or animal products that have been treated with antibiotics? Yeah, that's, I mean, this is a big issue. And we're, our lab doesn't study that directly. Some other labs are looking into that, whether or not some of the, I mean, the amount of antibiotic in the meat appears to be small, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not doing anything. I think a lot of the field right now is most concerned with the antibiotic resistance that those antibiotics are, are causing in um, these animals. And so if you come in contact with a, mi a microbe from that meat that has an antibiotic resistance gene, you eat that microbe, those microbes are amazing at sharing genes. They will swap them back and forth. Your bacteria now can pick up that antibiotic resistant gene and all of a sudden now you have a resistance to an antibiotic that you never took that the animal took. And so a lot of the field now is trying to figure out safe ways to make you know, animals healthy for meat consumption, but not transmit these antibiotic resistance genes to our own uh, community. Um, if the things that we can do is increase dietary fiber and fermented foods, the question, are there better diet, sources of dietary fiber? And is there, yeah, um, and yeah. you mentioned grains, but that's not really hunter-gatherer. And also with fermented foods, you said that they were live, to be live, they can't be cooked, but then there's this whole movement towards fermented foods, like sauerkraut, which is So, um, uh, part of why we started that Center for Human Studies is we want to ask these questions of, does any dietary fiber help? Is it lots amount, lots of any one type, or does it have to be a diversity of different types of dietary fiber? We don't know the answer to those questions. What we think is if we look at these traditional populations, their diet is pretty simple. They're only eating like five or six different kinds of foods, but if you look at the composition of the foods they are eating, the, the carbohydrates in there are incredibly complex. So we think that a diverse 
amount of dietary fiber is good. So that would be from plants, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, whatever. So these populations don't eat things like legumes and whole grains because those are a product of agriculture. But I think part of the, the problem with um, this, like it's sort of this paleolithic diet that people are interested in, is that we don't have access to the food that our paleolithic ancestors, ancestors ate because we've domesticated all the plants to make them less fibrous and higher in sugar. And so like that tuber that I showed you, there's no whole foods that you can go and find something like that. That food doesn't exist. And so how do you get a high fiber diet with the foods that we have? And legumes and grains are great because they have a lot of fiber. So it's an easy way to eat um, a lot of fiber in a small amount of food. We're running a study right now where we're telling people to increase dietary fiber as much as they possibly can. We don't give them an upper limit. We wanna see what's possible in kind of a, a Western culture. These people at best can get to 80 grams per fi of fiber per day. They said it's incredibly difficult because there's no like convenience foods really. I mean, you can eat like raw fruits and vegetables, but you know, they're eating a lot of beans and stuff. The other thing they said is it's incredibly hard to eat a lot of dietary fiber because they're so full. If you get to like 50 grams of dietary fiber, that's a lot of plants. You just, you become so full, you can't eat anymore. And so, you know, my husband and I joke that, oh, if we write another book, it should be the one rule diet because we tell these people just get as much dietary fiber as you can. And what we find is that their amount of saturated fat goes down, their amount of sugar that they eat go down, their total calories go down. We haven't told them to do any of that. It's just to eat that amount of fiber, you have no room for, for other types of food. The fermented food, the, the thing that's important to remember is if it's, if it's in like a refrigerated section, chances are it's not been processed in a way that would kill microbes. So sauerkraut is just cabbage they cut up you know, ferment, and then if you find it in the fridge section, and often you can tell because you open it and it like fizzes, that's the microbes generating um, gas from that, and that's a way to tell that it's alive. You back there? Yeah. Um, I read that the gut has more serotonin receptors than the brain, and I saw on your slide you talked about uh, the connection between gut health and mood, and I was wondering if you're lab does research into that or is there any interesting findings about the connection yeah our lab doesn't study the gut brain access specifically um there there is a there's a guy at UCLA, ucla emrin mayer and i think he has a new book out trying to mind gut connection something like that he studies that and i haven't had a chance to read his book but he's you know a reputable scientist so i would assume that his book is pretty pretty um good um Mayor, Emerin Mayor at UCLA, the, there's a ton of serotonin in the gut, but we know that serotonin is responsible for regulating gut motility. So what we don't know is all that serotonin just for that, is any of that serotonin made in the gut getting to our brain? We don't know if that's true. It's, it's exciting to think that that's what's happening. And we know from some other studies that they, they did this one study, they did fMRIs, fMRIs of women that had either had a probiotic supplement, I think yogurt versus not, and they, when they scanned their brains, the women that had had the yogurt had a different scan than the people that hadn't. So there's, there's something there. But again, like that community of microbes is so complicated. Our brain is so complicated. Trying to figure out how these two things are, it's gonna take a long time to figure that out. But there's there's something there. They're connected, there's no doubt. Do you wash the vegetables from your garden? <laughs> from our garden, no, no. And I, I joke that like my kids will pull a carrot out, they'll just brush it off and eat it. Um, but that's only because I know I don't spray my garden, I don't add e grocery store vegetables, I wash. I mean, the stakes are high, right? You hear these stories of E. coli, salmonella getting in the food, we don't want to go to a spot where we're so lax on our hygiene that that becomes more prevalent, but we just have to think about, like, when are situations where it's safe to 
to be a little less careful with sanitation. Can you give us a sample of what your family eats? Mm -hmm. And also, maybe people are more informed than I about soluble versus insoluble fiber. Yeah, so I'll start with the second part. Soluble versus insoluble is, is completely a chemical definition. And in fact, I think the new nutrition facts label isn't even gonna include that because it's meaningless as far as the biological activity. Some insoluble fiber is not fermented by the microbiota. So cellulose is an example. Our gut microbes can't digest cellulose. We can't digest cellulose. That's the like roughage that just goes through. But some soluble fiber is fermented, isn't. Some insoluble fermented isn't. That's why we came up with this term, microbiota accessible carbohydrates, because that means those are carbohydrates that our gut bacteria can ferment. Now the complicated thing about that is what your gut microbes can ferment and what yours may not be the same. There was a study done in Japan. Many people in Japan harbor a microbe in their gut that's able to degrade a type of carbohydrate that's found in seaweed. When we looked at American guts, they don't have that microbe. So for those people, they're, they're getting something out of that seaweed that we're not getting. And so it's gonna be a complicated thing to try to figure out what is fermented by your gut, but our goal in the future is that you would go to the physician, you would do like a microbiota typing, and then they would tell you, these are the foods that are gonna be best suited to the community of bacteria that you have. These are the probiotics that are best suited for the community that you have. Um, but we're just not there. Now, what my family and I eat. We focus on the fiber thing. We try to eat something fermented every day. Usually it's yogurt. We make our own kefir. We also ferment um, like vegetable, make sauerkraut, kimchi, those kinds of things. And regular yogurt that you buy from the store? Regular yogurt, which I get unsweetened. And so my kids are used to unsweetened yogurt which I know not all kids find appealing. So what I, the, I actually had a little trick for how I did this, because um, they used to eat sweetened yogurt. So I would buy the unsweetened yogurt and I would put like a little bit of maple syrup and then I would like slowly every time, less, 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 less. And they didn't, they never said anything. And then all of a sudden they were eating regular yogurt. And then there was a time we went to a hotel and they only had sweetened yogurt and they ate it and they were like, this is so weird. And I mean, they just were used to, that kind of sour taste. Um, you know, a lot of my husband, and you know, I hate to talk about this because then it seems unattainable. My husband likes to make sourdough bread from flour that we mill ourselves from wheat berries. <laughs> but that, that's just because that's we like doing that. What should we? Yeah, yeah. So you know, so we we'll, we'll eat that bread that we put like nut butter on. Nuts are a great source of fiber. A lot of oatmeal, um, those fruits, and um, green smoothies in the morning. We're big fans of smoothies, not the juice. You know, when you juice stuff, there's all that pulp that's, that you throw away. That's all the stuff the microbes wanna eat. So if you have it in a smoothie, then you're eating that too. Um, we just, hummus, beans, we don't, we're not vegetarian, we're not anything. We'll eat meat, we'll eat fish, but we, we just focus on getting a lot of fiber. And so many days we end up not eating meat. So you eat a lot of juice and vegetables. And so, we, so one thing I didn't talk about, and we have a, um, a study coming out, hopefully in the next couple months on this, that, that Hadza population, they eat extremely seasonal. Like they don't have a grocery store, so they just get what's, and what we find is their microbiota over the year changes in a seasonal pattern. So in the wet season, they're eating this one type of food, their microbiota looks this, in the dry season, it changes. When they go back to the wet season, it goes back. So there's this cycling thing. We don't see that in Westerners. We don't know if that's important. So our family tries to kind of eat in a seasonal way, both to try to mimic that a little bit in case it's important, and also it's a way of getting a diverse diet, many types of dietary fiber. When I talk about diverse diets, people are like, how can I eat all those different foods like all in one day? But I think you have to think of it like in the span of a year. So when it's like strawberry season, asparagus, you eat lots of that. And then in the time of year where something else is in season, you eat lots of that. Mm -hmm. Quickly, what you just commented on how the people in Tanzania, their microbiome changes mm -hmm. in season. Yeah. Do you think that the bacteria that is dormant in the gut but dormant or is it out because they're not eating that fiber and it comes back in when they eat that fiber like with your husband? That's a great question. We don't know. So we think what's happening 
if you look at the way the intestine is set up, there's these these little villi, these little crypts, these little like dips in there. And what we've started to see is that microbes will hide in there. And so we think what's happening is, you know, when times get, let's say you're a bacteria that loves the type of fiber that's in strawberries. So when it's strawberry time, you are going nuts, lots of you around because your food preferential food source is available. When strawberries aren't there, what we think happens is they hide in these little crypts. It's like a way of you know, hunkering down, and then they wait there, and then when the food comes back, they come back out and bloom. So we think that's what's happening. We don't know. It's possible that maybe they all, the bacteria is all gone, and then when that food is reintroduced in the next season, they're actually eating that bacteria along with the food, like it's part of the soil or the environment. We don't know. We have soil samples and environmental samples. We can look and see if it's there, but it's still hard to know if that's if it's supposed to be there or if it's just there because it's contaminated from the you people. Fast forward 50 years. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do we know what effect um, cheating on your fiber with um, methyl cellulose or psyllium, you know, metamucil, citrus cell yeah. have on the gut? Yeah. So it's interesting because I've, so I've talked to physicians about that, and what they've told me is that, you know, they'll, for people that, um, they want to increase motility, they'll give them something, they'll recommend something like Metamucil. And for some people it works great. And they said for some people it severely constipates them. Y yeah. And so what we think is that those people maybe has a community that can't ferment it or it's like resulting in something that is negative for them. And so, you know, we, we view those types of supplements as the bulking, kind of like cellulose, like it's not being fermented by the gut, but we don't really know. And it could be that it's different for each person, too. But you think that it's bulking it and not being fermented like cellulose? Exactly, yeah. I mean, you know that. Is that right? Well, I think the fact that it's not the same in each person makes me think that it's maybe not just bulking in everybody. Maybe for some people it is fermentable. We don't know. Again, one of these things in the future where we'll be able to tell you, these are all the different enzymes that your gut has. You can degrade cellulose you can, or psyllium husk. You can't. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you, I know in your book you talk about it, um, meat and the TMAO. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that for everybody? Yeah, so this was a study that was, I think, at the Cleveland Clinic. They looked at individuals. So there's this TMAO is this molecule that circulates, can circulate in our blood, and it's associated with adverse cardiovascular events. If you have high TMAO, you're at increased risk for a heart attack or stroke. Um, they were trying to figure out where this molecule came from. Turns out it's a product of um, one of the waste products that microbes make in fermentation. They make this molecule T TMA and that gets absorbed in the blood, and it's because the blood is oxygenated, it adds an oxygen and it makes TMAO. And so what they found was that individuals that ate a lot of meat, their microbes were producing a lot of this TMA. And that was kind of the link then, they were like, this is the link between high red meat diet and um, increased risk for cardiovascular events. So the, the kind of cool part of the study is they found, a, I can't remember if they were a vegetarian or a vegan, and they convinced that person to eat meat. This person had like never <laughs> eaten meat before. And what they found was that person made TMA, but much less so than a normal meat eater. And we know that vegetarians and vegans have a different microbiota than, than people that eat meat. And so the idea was that there were microbes in the meat eater's gut that was producing this compound that was leading to increased risk for cardiovascular events. And so the implication for that is that if we can steer the community in a way that you decrease production of that TMA, all of a sudden now you have a, a good therapeutic for decreasing the risk of, of heart disease. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful talk, thanks so much. Um, what do you make of some of these kits that you can do to get your uh, microbiome yes. like, you know, speciated or whatever? Is there any use to that? Yes. I am familiar with some of them, and I, th I think for the most part, it's just bull, I, most of it, I think. The, so American Gut is one we talk about in our book. That was started by a guy, he's a professor at UCSD, and he doesn't make any claims about 
diagnosing or telling you anything. He started that as a citizen science project. He wanted to just get a sense of like, what does everybody's microbiota look like? And I like that project because he doesn't say that he's you know, gonna cure any diseases. He charges what the cost is to run the sample and he makes that data available to researchers. So we've used that data when we compare like our Tanzania group, we use American gut people as our American cohort. Some of these other companies, not only, um, I, I don't know what their business model, I don't know if they're making money off of the, the, the test alone. Some of the tests I've seen from other people that have done it, they make pretty incredible claims on there. They will tell you like, this is the probiotic you need to take, and this is, you're missing this type of microbe or whatever. And it, it's not based on anything that I've seen that's, that's legitimate. Some of these companies even offer to make you like a, a custom probiotic cocktail based on your yeah. thing. And that's just complete, I mean, that's just, an, I don't know where they're getting that information from. So I would, I mean, Unfortunately, like it's great that people are excited about the microbiota for our field. It's it's amazing. But it, what I, what I'm seeing is a lot of companies and people profiting off this interest and putting information out there that's not real. That is, um, you know, ways that they can make money. So I would say, like, you know, if it's not apparent to you, um, or or if the if it looks like the person selling the thing has something to gain finan financially from it, I would be more skeptical of it. Yeah, and I mean, there are physicians that are ordering microbiota tests. I don't know what they're doing with that information. Because I'll tell I mean, I've been studying this for 15 years. People will show me their thing. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it looks, I can look at certain microbes and say this one looks like not the best, but maybe in the context of the other 500 that are there, it's totally fine. I mean, we know people with C. diff, you know, 20% of the population is walking around with C. difficile in their gut and don't know about it. So it's not that C. difficile having it causes disease. There's some other perturbation that has to happen. And so looking at your microbiome and saying, oh, well, this is a bad character, we need to get rid of it, I think is just too simplistic. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like from what you just said in the question and with your husband's kind of N of one, that it's more, like is the hypothesis more about the diversity of the microbiome versus do we really need the ancestral mm -hmm. microbiome and the specific microbiota that did get eradicated mm -hmm. and that we're not sure it can set up residence again and we want them to be residents versus if maybe now, since our genome hasn't caught up with the microbiome, that the resident microbiome that we're going to cultivate is really just about this, the dietary fiber. Yeah. And um, the best we can do is have a, a broad, a diverse microbiome. I think that's a hugely open question, and that's something that our lab is actively pursuing. We're isolating microbes from these traditional populations. We're going to start putting them in mice, seeing what happens, and eventually we want to put them into humans and see what happens if they're safe. We have no idea if we need those microbes or not. And so why I talk about diversity and fibers that, you know, people want to know what they can do now. These studies on these traditional populations and their microbes could be decades off before those things are realized as therapeutics. And so we're trying to think of ways that we can, because we know the composition appears like it's not great. How in the Western world, how can we fix that with things that are safe to do now? And so we think this increase in diversity through dietary fiber is beneficial. I mean, there's been lots of studies showing that fiber is beneficial, and we think it's through this increase in diversity. Whether or not adding those ancestral species back provides an even greater benefit is a completely open question. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the difference between prebiotics and probiotics mm -hmm. and the fact that you need the prebiotics before the probiotics can actually do any good in your body. Yeah. And then what really are prebiotics? So prebiotics are really, they, I think they're officially defined as carbohydrates that feed beneficial bacteria. So in that definition, dietary fiber is a prebiotic. Those carbohydrates feed the beneficial bacteria in their gut. I think like inulin is an example of a prebiotic fiber that's everywhere. I, there's nothing special about inulin. It's just been heavily studied. 
and so people are familiar with that. So prebiotic manufacturers use that as a, as a, as a prebiotic. There are some things that people sell that are called symbiotics. So they will add a prebiotic, say inulin, and then they will add a probiotic, an organism that utilizes that inulin. And the idea is that the, having the two of them together is, uh, provides a better benefit than having each one individually. Um, I don't know if that's really the case. I kind of this, I just, you know, I, I think in our book we wrote, like I view that the producile as the prebiotic aisle. That's, that's where all the beneficial stuff is, yeah. In the back. Um, you've gotten me really excited about expanding my vegetable garden, but I'm wondering, <laughs> um, when you look for seeds, do you care about whether they've been hybrided or if, they, or if they're heirloom, or yeah. what do you do when you look for seeds for your garden? I, I'm, I, I should be like looking into this, but I don't, I, I, if it's possible, I choose organic seeds, but that's not from any sort of health standpoint. It's just more of like, I don't want the chemicals used in the environment. Um, because again, even things like, you know, Roundup is the, the chemical found in Roundup. There's been early studies showing that it affects the microbiota. So we don't really know. Um, I just pick like what grows well and and actually because my kids I try to pick things that they can just pick and eat right there. Little tomatoes, these little Mexican cucumbers that are like small that they can just pick and eat, carrots, those kinds of things. Do you treat kombucha? I you know, so we've made kombucha before. Um, and we like it, but yeah, it was just, we're making kefir, we're making bread, we're just kind of picking <laughs> the couple things that, yeah, it's easy. But I, I mean, a lot of people in our lab make kombucha. I don't really like it, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, so I have two questions. One is, um, I had spent some time in Nepal and a physician there had said, oh my gosh, these little kids running around in the Himalayas have like 13 species of bacteria that would make you and I sick. You know, they have mm -hmm. Giardia and Salmonella and E. coli and Shigella and they don't have diarrhea. Um, so when you talk about the microbiome bio, of um, these traditional mm -hmm. remote groups, are you c including in that those pathogens that we would consider pathogens? And um, I always, I'm not sure about that. That's the, my first question. And mm -hmm. the second is totally unrelated, which is, um, have you looked at what chemotherapy does to the microbiome or in particular bone marrow transplant patients pre and post mm -hmm. because yeah. we really slam them to yeah. get rid of, and you know their guts go through, you know, um, really a tremendous upheaval to say it mildly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that I wonder what happens um, like at six months or a year. I don't know if anyone's looked at that, but yeah. in those BMT patients. Or I think I, I don't, I mean, I know that people are looking into this and I, for cancer patients and, and bone marrow transplant. And so I don't know if those studies are out yet. I'm sure they're seeing differences. I mean, anytime you perturb right. the system, yeah. you see a difference. Um, I, where a lot of the exciting stuff is happening with cancer patients is with this new like immunotherapy. We know that the microbiota is wired into the immune system and tunes that um, in a very profound way. And so a lot of people are looking into whether or not they can make these um, immune therapies more effective by priming the, the microbiota first, get the immune system tuned in a way that when the like you know, anti-PD-1 or these other drugs come in, that the immune system's really ready to pounce on those cancer cells. That's all very early. I don't know of anything um, data-wise that, that's out on that. Um, and then what your first? The pathogens, you know, when we oh, talk yeah, yeah. about remote um, cultures, they yeah. have a lot of pathogens that would make mm -hmm. any of us sick. And so, I don't know you know, are. people talk about bacteria in the gut, but there are tons of viruses in there and there's tons of parasites in there, at least for these traditional populations. The way that our lab studies it, we're only focused on the bacteria because it already seems like kind of an overwhelming problem or you know, thing that we, we've started looking at viruses in the gut. It's what, what's amazing, so there are viruses in the gut that, that aren't human viruses, they're viruses that infect bacteria. I mean, the gut is so fascinating. There's like, you know, this community of bacteria, there's these viruses. It's like, you know, predator, prey. There's all these dynamics going on that we're just starting to get a handle on. The, the 
bacterial viruses that are in the Hadza are very different than what we see in Westerners, but we don't really know that much about what those viruses are doing. We know that these guys have tons of parasites. We don't look for that. We're not looking at that either. We know Westerners basically don't have parasites. And there are people that study this and feel that part of the increase in Western disease is that we don't have those cues from the parasites anymore. Our genome evolved in a time where parasites were just a part of being human, and so it, it tuned our immune system. It was something our body expected, and, and the question is now that we've eliminated that completely, have we changed our immune system in a way that's not normal anymore? And there are people that have you know, allergies or inflammatory bowel disease, other autoimmune issues that will say that if they, you know, get a parasite, they feel better. And so some people are looking at parasites as maybe being a way of treating um, inflammatory diseases. But that's, you know, early on. Ideally, you would have, you know, people talk about, you know, maybe in childhood, we need to give kids parasites get the immune system primed properly, cure them of the parasites, and then hopefully everything is, is good after that, but that's just starting. Mm -hmm.